The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory Jesus said to his disciples, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its taste, with what can it be seasoned? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city set on a mountain cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and then put it under a bushel basket. It is set on a lampstand where it gives light to all in the house. Just so, your light must shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your heavenly Father. The Gospel of the Lord. So the most important spiritual question of the day is, will it be the Patriots or the Falcons? <laughs> you can pray about it. <laughs> On Thursday, February the 2nd, we celebrated the feast of the presentation of Jesus in the temple by Mary and Joseph, 40 days after his birth. And within that temple were two very holy people, <laughs> Simeon and Anna, praising God night and day. And Simeon boldly proclaims that now he can die in peace because he had encountered the gift of salvation, the light of the nations in the person of Christ Jesus. Last Thursday was also Grandparents' Day during Catholic Schools Week, and it was a joy to welcome over 200 grandparents to our school mass. As it was Candlemas Day, the Feast of the Presentation focuses on Jesus as the light of the world and is therefore a day when we bless a selection of the candles that are used in the church throughout the year, I focused on the words that are proclaimed when we receive our baptismal candles. Receive the light of Christ. This light is entrusted to you to be kept burning brightly because this son and daughter of yours has been enlightened by Christ. May they always walk as children of the light. Today's gospel affirms who we are. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. Words flowing from the lips of Jesus as we continue to focus and reflect upon the Sermon on the Mount, which began, if you remember, last Sunday with the Beatitudes. What Jesus is basically saying is that if we live the Beatitudes, we will flavor this world with God's presence and we will cast off the darkness with his light, with the truth of the gospel. And we know that as Christians, as disciples, we are all called to make a difference in this world. We're all called to change this world, and if necessary, to turn it inside out and upside down with the presence of Christ and the values, the truth of God's kingdom. The prophet Isaiah very clearly lays out God's vision for God's people. Share your bread with the hungry. Shelter the oppressed and the homeless. Clothe the naked when you see them and do not turn your back on your own. If you remove from your midst oppression, false accusation, and malicious speech, if you bestow your bread on the hungry and satisfy the afflicted, then light shall rise for you in the darkness, and the gloom shall become for you like midday. This vision would have actually fed the heart and the faith of Jesus Christ as he began his ministry, as he began his mission. And we know that if this is Christ's vision and mission, it must also be ours. And I doubt if there is any single person in this church this morning who does not believe this to be so. Living this mission and vision, being salt and light, are the Franciscans in Syria. And Franciscan father Luke Gregory writes this, we stayed a night in our friary in Damascus. It was with great satisfaction that we saw how our friars are taking care of the local people, Christians and Muslims alike. Father Raimondo, one of our friars, with a religious sister, Sister Yola, has set up a home to receive cancer patients from all over Syria who need treatment in the hospitals in Damascus. They have also opened a creche for children. 
It was very edifying to see these works of mercy. Then we drove to Aleppo, so much destruction, whole suburbs and neighborhoods completely wiped out, spent missiles littering the streets, only a few hours of water and electricity each day. Yet despite all this, there is a sense of hope. The friars and sisters remain faithful to their missions during the bombings. The Catholic hospitals remained open, serving the many wounded. The friars continue to distribute food, water, and medicines to the people. The church is like a beacon in the darkness. It is good that the Catholic Church in Syria serves all those in need without distinction of race, creed, or color. Just so, says Jesus, your light must shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your heavenly Father. Another light which is displaying the presence of a merciful God and stretching the human heart to embrace the heart of Christ was the declaration of life left by Father Robert René, a priest from the St. Augustine Diocese here in Florida who was murdered last year. In this document, written some 22 years ago, he seems to have foreseen his own killing. Father René enshrined his opposition to the death penalty, stating that whoever killed him be spared execution, no matter how heinous their crime or how much I may have suffered. I request that the person found guilty of homicide for my killing not be subject or put in jeopardy of the death penalty under any circumstances. So the bishops have petitioned the court to drop capital punishment in this case. The body of Father Robert was found riddled with bullets in woods in Georgia in April 2016. He was killed by a man that he'd been trying to help for many months. He had spent his ministry helping society's most troubled people, including convicts and those who have mental problems. He was well aware for the potential violence that might, invo that might involve his ministry, but he cared for those people nonetheless, states Archbishop Wilton Gregory of Atlanta. And his own bishop, Felipe Estevez, said the alleged killer clearly deserved punishment, but added imposing a sentence of death as a consequence of killing only perpetuates the cycle of violence in our community. What a great light to shine in our world, in the midst of a world which is so often crying out for retribution, for an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And finally, the church, in the last week, through embracing the vision of the prophet Isaiah, has shone the light of Christ on the executive order by President, by President Trump with regard to refugees. It is a primary duty of every leader in every nation to safeguard its citizens. And I would encourage all of us to read very carefully the statements of our bishops in regard to this order and to pray over them and to discuss them very calmly and with an open heart. Christ will always stretch our minds and our hearts, sometimes beyond what we may seem to be reasonable. There is no such thing as a comfortable Christian. And so I would refer you to what our own bishop, Gregory Parks, together with Cardinals Dolan of New York and Cupich of Chicago, to, to what they have written and what they have published. Cardinal Cupich recognizes that there was already a lengthy and thorough vetting process before refugees were admitted to the United States, and that we must not forget who and what these people are actually fleeing from. And he writes, the world is watching as we abandon our commitments to American values. These actions give aid and comfort to those who would destroy our way of life. They lower our estimation in the eyes of many peoples who want to know America as a defender of human rights and religious liberty. It is time to put aside fear and join together to recover who we are and what we represent in a world badly in need of hope and solidarity. So I've shared with you this morning three very different scenarios, but each of them display the kind of people Christ calls us to be if we are to flavor this world with his presence and enlighten it with his truth. As I stated in my homily last week, the Sermon on the Mount gives us our identity as disciples. It dispels complacency 
and stretches our human hearts to love as Christ loves us. Amen.